Okay, we've just reviewed big O, big omega, and theta. In this section, I'm going to introduce the little guys, little o and little omega, which are a stricter form of inequality that don't allow equality. And we're going to look at some properties of the asymptotic notations, useful facts about them, ways we use them in equations. Big O is analogous to less than or equal to and little o is analogous to less than. And in a similar manner, omega is analogous to greater than or equal to, and little omega is analogous to greater than. So little o and little omega are strictly not equal. How do we define this? Well, let's start with little o. Little o is asymptotic less than. We're going to say little o of g of n is equal to all functions such that, now let's pause here, what do we want to say here? With big O, we wanted all functions such that we could find some constant that you can multiply g of n by that eventually above some n naught, g of n would always be larger than f of n. Here we want it to be the case that for any constant that we attempt, g of n is always bigger than f of n. We cannot find a way for f of n to catch up to g of n. Eventually g of n is going to overwhelm f of n. So we're, this is a more universally quantified statement. We're going to have to say for all constants, c greater than 0. Now this part's more familiar. There exists a constant n not greater than 0 such that, and here's the main body of the definition, for all n greater than equals n naught. Now this body of the definition I just wrote is similar to the other ones. The difference is in the quantification. The quantification says eventually uh, you won't be able to find any constant that lets f catch up with g. So if this is the case we say that f is asymptotically smaller than g. Now let's look at the situation for little omega. Little omega is a set of functions such that this is actually going to be identical to the uh, definition for little o. We want to have a case where for any constant you can find after some n naught, a certain relationship holds. So this part here will also go here. But the difference is that we want g to be a strict lower bound on f where equality is not allowed. So this part's different in one small way, which you can probably guess. We put g here. Now, um, I could draw the graphs like I did before, but the graphs will look exactly the same. The difference is not in the, how we draw the pictures, you know, one function is above the other. The difference is in the quantification, that for all constants, greater than zero, no matter what constant c you pick, we can find an n after which g overwhelms f here or f overwhelms g here. We can write this out, uh, we can understand these notations by writing out a different form of the definition. In the case of um, O, we can say the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio between f of n and g of n Remember, O, oh, this is O, oh, that where G is going to overwhelm F, the limit is zero. As N grows, eventually F gets so much smaller than G that this ratio approaches zero. And in a very similar manner with omega, we can say the limit as N goes to infinity of F of N over g of n is infinity because here f of n is the one overwhelming g of n. Here I'll clean that up a bit here for you. Okay, why don't we look at some examples now. Let's do the same example as before. On the left hand side we're going to ask what is little o of n squared before we were asking what's big O of n squared. Uh, if we look at uh, what's in the set little o of n squared, one example would be n to the 1.9999, however many nines you want, 
that's, that's going to be little o of n squared because no matter what constant you choose, eventually the growth of n squared is going to overwhelm the growth of n to any smaller exponent. A little bit more um, common and perhaps obvious example is if you divide n squared by some other function of n, then that's also a little o of n squared because the growth of this n squared will overwhelm n squared divided by some function of n that's positive. <coughs> some ones that are not in the low of n squared might include uh, n squared is not of n squared and uh, n squared divided by a constant say is not the low of n squared because bigger constants will overwhelm this constant. Okay, similar manner over here omega, remember omega is where g is a lower bound on f so if we're looking at omega of n squared, let's ask what's in, well, n to the 2.0001 uh, is omega of n squared because this uh, n to an exponent slightly bigger than 2 will eventually overwhelm n squared. And similar, n squared times log n is omega of n squared. But one that is not is, again, n squared, because this is simply like saying 2 is not less than 2, for example. To be either little o or omega of something, it can't be equal to it. Okay, let's now move on to some uses of these notations in equations that we use to do analysis. So with all of these notations, we've, we've uh, pointed out that they technically stand for sets. So Technically, we should say f of n is a member of the set, for example, theta of n squared or whatever function we're claiming it's, it's related to. But for convenience, we write instead in an equation form f of n equal theta of n squared, uh, which is kind of an abusive notation, but it makes certain kinds of manipulations useful that I'm about to show you this expression, theta of n squared, is standing for a, a set of anonymous functions. And we want to refer to those functions when we don't care which one it is. Then it's useful to use this notation. So here's one example. If we're going to use this any asymptotic notation on the right-hand side, and we can do this with big O and uh, little o and big omega and little o, but I'll just, speak, I'll just use theta in these examples. Uh, let's say we have um, analyzed an algorithm and we've figured out that it takes this many steps, um, and we want to say, well, that's really in the class 2n squared plus theta of n. So here we've got an equation, but this term is a set, not a quantity like these other things. So how can you do that? Well, because we're using this to stand for all the members of its set. So we're saying this equation will hold uh, for some function in that set. So we can pick some function in this set and we can always find a C for it that makes this equation true. You know, the C and the N naught. Uh, so this really means, this is the same thing as saying 2N squared plus 3N plus 1 uh, is equal to 2N squared plus some function, F of N, where, of course, uh, F of N uh, is theta of N, or if you prefer, is in the set theta of N. For example, we could pick um, f of n is equal to 3n plus 1, and that would make this true. Uh, but we could sometimes encounter situations where it doesn't really matter that we use exactly the same thing that's over here. So when you see the um, asymptotic notation on the right-hand side of the equation, think of it as uh, the existential. That means there exists a function uh, such that we can make this all true. On the left-hand side, uh, asymptotic notation functions more like a universal quantification. But we only use it on the left-hand side when it's also on the right-hand side. So let's look at an example here. 2n squared plus theta of n is theta of n squared. And we read this in the sense that this term here is universally, quant universally quantified, and this term here is existentially quantified. We read this as for all of functions in this set, there exists another function in this set such that this equation can be true. So let's say 
for all f of n in this set, there exists some g of n. Um, let me make this explicit. There exists the g of n in theta of n squared such that, uh, we read it in red here, 2n squared plus f of n is equal to g of n. And of course you can see why that holds here. You know, n squared is a dominating term. So this whole thing, no matter what function you put here that's dominated by n, the n squared will be the larger dominator. So the theta of n squared is the right category to put it in. Okay, so that's going to be some things we do that uh, makes manipulating these things uh, useful when we treat them as if they can be terms and equations. And then we can do basic algebra. You know, we might have done an analysis where we said 2n squared plus 3n plus 1 was the expression we got for our runtime. And then we might want to simplify that. We can say, well, that's really 2n squared plus theta of n. So we can get rid of all these extra terms. But then we can recognize that n squared dominates n. So we can say, well, this is really theta of n squared. So essentially we've done an algebraic manipulation using anonymous functions as represented by this, these uh, notations that represent sets of functions that have certain inequality relations to the functions we're interested in. Okay, next we're going to look at some properties of these notations, of these sets really. Okay, here are some useful relational properties. We're going to look at transitivity, reflexivity, uh, symmetry, and transpose symmetry. Tra transitivity, if f of n is in g, and g of n is in h, then f of n is in h. And one way to understand this, of course, is that theta is a form of equality. Uh, so if a is equal to b and b is equal to c, a is equal to c is a way to think of it. Here we think of uh, a big O is, is really like uh, in inequality. f of n is bounded by g of n, and g of n is bounded by h of n, and of course f of n is bounded by h of n. This one makes sense the other way. Transitivity just like uh, transitivity of inequality, and this is the, the strict versions for f of n is strictly bounded and g of n is strictly bounded, and so on. So those should be pretty clear. Let's now take a look at um, reflexivity. So reflexivity is a function is always related to itself by theta, big O, and omega. And what about little o and little omega? Can they be reflexive? Think about what they're analogous to. Now let's take it. I'm going to make a little bit of room here, and we will take a look at symmetry. So symmetry, if f of n is related, is related by theta to g of n, well, it, it's related that way to g of n if and only if g of n is related to f of n by theta. What about the other ones? Can you conclude this kind of symmetry with the other one? Think about, again, the relationship they hold to each other. And finally, let's take a look at transpose symmetry. Now here's transpose symmetry. f of n is bounded above by g of n, if and only if g of n is bounded below by f of n. That makes sense. Here we've got f of n is in a subordinate relationship to g of n. This is just another way of saying it. And in a similar manner, f of n, if it is strictly less than, in a sense, g of n, that would be if only if g of n is strictly greater than f of n. Okay, would any of the other ones work this way? One last comment we have to make here is we have to be careful. There's, unlike with um, numbers, you know, with any given number a and b, one of these three will hold. You know, either a is less than, less than b or a is greater than b or a equals b. Of course, that's used in the binary search procedure. But with functions, some functions may not be comparable to each other. They may be incomparable. And we're going to end with a brief example of error functions where that's true. For example, n to the 1 plus sine n is you cannot make a comparison of that to n. Since sine n oscillates between negative 1 and 1, so 1 plus sine n oscillates between 0 and 2. So you're raising n to the 0 power, which is 1, and the 2, which is like n squared, 
And so this thing's going to jump above and below n. And maybe we'll end with a quick look at this in a grapher. So here's our grapher. And let's plot first. We've got the functions n and n to the 1 plus sine n. But in this grapher, I have to use y and x. So x will play the role of n. So there's the growth rate of um, n or, or x. Uh, but now let's add an equation and uh, say y equals x to the exponent 1 plus sine x. Wow! There you go. This will never ever get into a situation where you can say one of these is bigger than the other. Okay, this concludes our review of asymptotic concepts, including the little o and little omega and properties of all of the asymptotic notations and how we use them in equations. I just have one more topic as part of three, part three, which is a review of some basic discrete mathematics that we'll be using this semester.